place to meet, where all is not well, where folk are trapped and some are vulnerable because of the whims of the powerful, where all things are not all bright and beautiful. In such a place, there is a story to tell of what happens when God's people speak truth to power and the gospel turns out to be no protection as the self-appointed take their thrones. A place God listens to the least of us as we offer to heaven the lamentations of the world and know they are heard and held and honoured. Let us gather in just such a place. Hello, I'm Roddy Hamilton, the Minister of New Kilpatrick Parish. And today, already I bet you feel cheered and effervescent with joy at these opening words. The church has received the name of being quite a doer place. We're all miserable and we leave you are often with a burden rather than with a joy. Obviously, that's a caricature. Well, hopefully it is. But there is in faith an important and holy place where we can bring the hurts and the longings, the troubles we wrestle with and the lot in life we have and cry to God about it. And heaven hears. It's a meeting place with God, with truth, with honest faith. And that's where we gather to worship today. Loving God, the generosity of heaven and the abundance of hope, in such gift we gather and find ourselves found in you. A safe place for us 
in a world that feels less so. A place where silence is enough, when too many contradictory words fight to be heard. For compassion surrounds us, when conflict feels like the only way. Loving God, in such a place as this, maybe centre ourselves, fill ourselves with a peace known best only to you. Feel the breadth and breath of the Spirit within us and between us and make holy this space where we trust with you. Holy God, holy and generous God, here we bring ourselves as we are and ask you in a love that is generous and abundant to lift those weights we carry of hurt and prejudice, of fear and selfishness and find freedom in your word and life in your way. And we shape a community anew, each of us alive to what is good and hopeful and rich in the diverse colours of peace where we can live in the world with our hope in the kingdom. Hear us in the sharing of that shared prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Philip was his name. It was a marriage of convenience. There was no love between us, but we did have a daughter, Salome. But when the marriage was no longer convenient, we divorced, and I was married to Antipas, his brother. But this didn't go down well with some of the local religious folk, one in particular, John the Baptizer. He was making a nuisance of himself commenting on my marriage to Herod Antipas, a divorcee and keeping it in the family. His comments would have been fine if they didn't go further, but he had a growing following. He was making them restless, confident. It was dangerous to be on the wrong side of his followers more than we already were. But this marriage was not my choice. I was married on to Herod. I was as trapped as anybody. John was making what life I had more difficult. So the chance came to secure my future, and more importantly, my daughter's future. If John was silenced, we were rid of a chink that would continue to trouble Salome's life. So I persuaded her to dance, the poor thing. It was an awful ass, but had a purpose. The men were there together. It was always that way. The women in their own chambers. I heard the music and the cheering. Salome was clearly dancing well. And then a knock on my door. Herod has asked me what I want. He was drunk and weak enough to offer half his kingdom. But Salome didn't know what to ask for. The Baptist head, I replied. So without understanding why, that was what she asked for. Herod hesitated, looked round at his wealthy and powerful guests and didn't want to lose face, so he agreed. The head was delivered on a platter to his guests and then at my door as a sign of his love and loyalty. It was a moment I felt I had achieved some security for my daughter, though what kind of mood Herod would be in now, I did not know. He would be abusive to me for weeks, but it would be worth the knowledge that Salome would be safer despite how awful it made me feel, asking her to do what she did.
That is perhaps one way of reading the story, placing the focus on the women, the least able to change their circumstances. But let us now hear it in the original biblical version, with the emphasis on the men. Mark's version of this is a bit mixed up about who's who. Regardless of what you hear in the passage, Herodias is the wife of Herod, the daughter commonly known as Salome, a name given to her by Josephus, the Jewish historian, is actually never named in the Bible. Mark 6, 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and asked her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Archers, Star Trek Discovery, the great pottery throwdown, the warm spaces art group in the church and the midweek service. Anyone work out the link? Archers, Star Trek, pottery throwdown, art group and the midweek service? Well, let me tell you, these are the places I go in order to get cheered up. Well, I, mean, I can't do pottery nor paint, Ruri in the Archers has caused bitterness and anger in his family again and the entire galaxy is threatened by a mysterious, randomly moving DMA, that's a dark matter anomaly in Star Trek. But they're all still a lot cheerier than the persistent headlines of tax inquiries, political bullying, conflict, environmental tipping points, interest rates, Brexit and presbytery plans. Where do you go to get cheered up these days? I know the church hasn't always had the reputation of being a jolly place. In the past, at least, you know, a good Scottish Calvinist culture has led us to feel guilty if we laugh here together. No longer, hopefully. But sometimes, 
you have to shape a space to acknowledge Jesus isn't a happy pill. And there are times when we don't feel particularly upbeat about things. Sometimes we need to express we feel low, disconnected, and recognise faith isn't a pick-me-up. Which is where we find, perhaps, ourselves in today's story of Herodias and the, the, the plattered head of the Baptists. It's not exactly a happy outcome. A young girl is sexualised for a group of men's entertainment and there is a negotiation over a decapitation. Some see Herodias as a cruel, manipulative Beelzebub, no, <laughs> Jezebel, which is the parallel story in the Hebrew scriptures. Some see her as looking after her daughter's future using the only power that she has, regardless of how terrible the outcome. She's just securing a future. Either way, we need to ask, where is the good news? Seriously, why is this story here? Where is the optimism, the hope, the promise? Is there any? Some believe everything in the Bible points to hope. There's always a chink of light. But others live with a faith that honestly sits there and sees nothing other than, if you want to speak truth to power, this is what happens. Being faithful to the kingdom is dangerous. You can get yourself killed. Ask John the Baptist. Ask Jesus, for that matter. I once preached on Ecclesiastes 3, a time to live and a time to die, etc. Telling the story of someone who was feeling very low and being an artist designed his Christmas cards with those words from Ecclesiastes on it. And people asked why. And they replied, sometimes that is all there is. And that's how I feel right now. And my supervisor challenged me, where is the good news? And I had to say, sometimes there isn't any. And he wasn't happy. I made sure all my sermons ended on a high note thereafter for him. But that is not always how people feel. And perhaps does a disservice to faith. Sometimes there is no moral, just a reality that is difficult, that sets us adrift, that disconnects us from what once brought us strength and hope. But, and this is why I love the Bible, all that's there. In the pages of this holy book we call the good news, this is perfectly legitimate, this is honest, this is faithful to have words that recognise sometimes there is no good news. Not yet. There are books in the Bible we are invited to read when we are in places we are at the moment, a country that just feels broken and morally empty, devoid of any vision close to compassion. And sometimes we can't end on a high note. Sometimes it feels as those disciples of John felt at the end of this story. And it would do a disservice to our faith and our humanity to spin some twee silver lining. Rather, the Bible gives us stories and words to accompany us in these times. When we are in that place, there is one thing to hold on to. This is not where it ends. This is not the last word. The words you are going to hear were written in the echo of the exile to Babylon, of the people of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's streets are now empty. Tumbleweed rolls and God is no longer in the temple. To whom do we now cry? Who will hear us? It is that feeling of loss the Bible invites us to admit to, 
and offers it as a holy and sacred act. It is real. It is honest. It is how God's people felt then and are allowed to admit they feel today. You're invited then to pause now and be honest and know it is not inappropriate or unfaithful to feel that way and to voice it all to heaven. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a facile. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Sion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. Thank you for allowing us to accompany you today in worship. It's quite blustery out here today, so hopefully that hasn't interfered with too much of our worship. As always, we continue online and on the podcast and on phone lines, as well as in the church face-to-face. And in these different ways, we create community and hopefully support each other wherever we are and whatever we need. We don't always do that well, and we admit to that, but we are hopefully learning and, and re-skilling and revaluing ourselves and the relationships we have with each other. We do that as well, not just in worship, but in all the other activities that take place in the church. And our bulletin outlines all of these and I invite you to read through that at your leisure. You can find that on the website at nkchurch.org.uk as always, or you can receive that by post or by email. So just call the office 0419 428827 if you would like to receive that in any way and you don't already do so. So please do read through that. We're moving through um, a season called Epiphany. We're about to go into Lent in a couple of weeks time and then we are beginning a new series um, of discussions and there will be more about that in the next couple of weeks but it will be happening every week and you're invited to take part in that. We might be able to do something of that online, but we'll also do something face-to-face. So so I'll invite you to keep note of that as it comes towards us. So in these ways and in all these other ways, we are God's people. So let us gather all these activities together in our prayers for others. Let us pray.
go in peace in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, common life of the Holy Spirit, be with us all and travel with us wherever we go. Amen.